I'm Dinda Elliott. I'm the executive director of the Fairbank Center, and we are especially lucky today to welcome one of the leading thinkers on contemporary China, Professor Yasheng Huang. Um, Yasheng Huang, Huang Yasheng, is Epic Foundation Professor of Global Economics and Management at the MIT Sloan School of Management, and we are very proud that Yasheng is also an associate in research here at the Fairbank Center. Uh, this year, he's serving as a visiting fellow at the Kissinger Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, Professor Huang served as an associate dean in charge of MIT Sloan's global partnership programs and its action learning initiatives. Uh, he's also held faculty positions at the University of Michigan and at Harvard Business School. He's a prolific writer, the author of 11 books in both English and Chinese, and his most recent book, The Rise and Fall of the East, how exams, autocracy, stability, and technology brought China's success and might lead to its decline. Professor Huang is also a co-principal investigator in a large-scale large multidisciplinary research project on food safety in China. And he founded and runs China Lab, ASEAN Lab, and India Lab, which provide low-cost consulting services to small and medium enterprises. I've known Yasheng for more than 30 years of friendship. And I can tell you that Professor Huang is more often than not the smartest person in the room. And he's usually not the fun today. and he's <laughs> well doing pretty well. And he's usually the funniest too, as you can see. Um, we are equally lucky to have Professor Yuhua Wang as our discussant and moderator today. Uh, Yuhua is professor of government and his research focuses on two aspects of the politics of state building what contributes to the emergency of effective and durable statehood, and after an effective state emerges, how can it be constrained? Um, his latest book, The Rise and Fall of Imperial China, The Social Origins of State Development, examines how effective statehood emerges and endures, and has great, tremendous relevance to China today. Uh, so it's now my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Professor Huang. Thank you so much, uh, Dinda. Uh, it's great to be uh, back at uh, Fairbank Center, and, and thank you for the invitation, and, uh, and also look forward to um, uh, exchanging views with uh, Yu Hua. Um, we have similar interests in history and political development, so I really uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to our uh, conversation. Uh, so today, um, the topic is uh, critical issues confronting and China, and then I sort of describe the topic in rather broad and vague uh, terms, not talking about real estate and uh, decoupling, but it is about how the objective function of the Chinese uh, Communist Party uh, changed over time, right? Um, and, and then changed back and forth. So essentially describing um, the, the Deng era, the evolution of the Deng era, uh, through uh, Jiang and Hu and now to uh, Xi Jinping, and how the objective functions of the Chinese state have been variously defined. So that's kind of the topic. And it is based on the book that just came out, um, The Rise and the Fall of the East, but it's also based on the revision of my 2008 book um, from the Cambridge University Press. I'm almost done with the uh, revision. So the talk is based on these uh, two books, but primarily on the rise and fall of the East. And so I'm going to say a little bit more about that book and just to make sure that, uh, to explain what the idea, the general idea of the book is, and, and then go into some uh, descriptive details <coughs> extracted from the book about the reform era. Uh, so we as scholars and authors uh, draw inspiration from various sources so for me, it is autocrats, right? 
and so I dedicate my whole book to them. Um, and, um, so I, I, I don't think I could have a, uh, a professional career without the ultra class. Um, bad for many, many things, but kind of good for me, um, professionally speaking. And, um, and this is the table of the contents of, of the book. And the East uh, stands for examination, autocracy, uh, stability, and technology. So there are many, many really good books about the historical, uh, historical origins of the Chinese Communist Party, of contemporary China. Um, my book is not built on a chronological sequence. Uh, rather it alternates between history and today. So the first chapter is about, one chapter is about the exam system and then the next chapter is about the CCP's meritocracy. It is very broad in terms of the coverage and as I said before, it alternates between history and the contemporary <coughs> period. And so the four topics are exam, uh, could you system, uh, autocracy, stability, and technology, how these four forces have shaped China's past and continue to shape China today. Right? It's descriptive, uh, analytical, and also prescri uh, prescriptive. The last chapter is on prescribing a vision for uh, the country if the country decides to um, revise and reform its current system. Now, at least that's my intention. If I don't succeed in terms of delivering the results, that, that's, that, that's my problem. But at least by intention, what I want to do is I don't want to, um, I want to base my uh, views of, um, of a future China based on history, based on facts and data rather than based on values, right? So that, that's my idea. Okay, my talk is going to focus on contemporary China, and I define contemporary China extremely narrowly, uh, China since 1978. I'm not going to talk about the culture system, I'm not going to talk about the history. And, and let me make the following points uh, in my talk. The first point is uh, politics and economics are uh, complements rather than substitutes. Um, essentially, the idea is uh, liberal politics go with liberal economics and vice versa, right? So that's actually very different from a uh, popular view which says that in order to uh, reform Chinese economy, you need a strong man, you need an autocrat I go directly against that view. Um, and, and I think facts and evidence actually point to exactly the opposite conclusion, which is that when you have more fragmentation at the, uh, in the political system, you actually have more economic reforms. When you have concentration of power, you have less economic reforms. You can actually have uh, reversals of the reforms. The second point is that if you look at the reform era from 78 to, um, I define the reform era as from 78 to 2018. Right? So in my book, the current period is not a reform uh, era anymore. And the true turning point is 1989, the Tiananmen. Uh, the rise of autocracy, the reversal of economic reforms, almost all of them can be traced to 1989. The third um, is uh, talking about GDP targeting. Right? So this is going back to the point I was making earlier, which has to do with the objective function of the Chinese state. Um, now the GDP tar targeting has been relaxed and why that relaxation of the GDP targeting is so consequential. And then I'm going to end on commenting on the, what is known as economic long COVID, 
why is it Chinese economy didn't bounce back? Right? So there's a famous article by Adam Posen uh, who sort of coined this very creative term uh, that, that Chinese economy is suffering from long, uh, from economic uh, long COVID. So that part is more about uh, coming from the, the revision of my, uh, of my book. So let me go back to the 1980s. Right? Uh, to me, you know, mainly because I was a young person, so I missed that period. The 1980s is the most remarkable decade uh, by far compared with 1990s, 2000s, and definitely compared with today. Um, politics was gentle, right? Um, the political competition was no longer political struggles, but really political rivalries, right? So the basic idea, the basic difference between political struggles and, and political rivalries is that political rivalries um, allow you to live and let live. You don't pursue your political rivals all the way to uh, jail, to criminalization. And they were soft landing. You know, Hua Guofeng didn't last very long. Hui Yaobang was sacked, for sure. But they were soft landing, right? Both of them retained uh, membership in the Central Committee, retained uh, privileges as um, uh, leaders of the country. Uh, Hu Yaobang retained the Politburo seat, right? There was no criminalization of politics or politicization of uh, corruption issue. You know, they were not put on a trial and sentenced to you know, 15 years in, in jail and things like that. Right? And that was a remarkable achievement by Deng Xiaoping and after the Cultural Revolution. And then the other uh, piece of data is that China in the 1980s didn't have you know, institutional separation of power for sure, right? So there's not an independent Congress, independent judiciary, and then the executive branch. But there was a separation of individual functionaries and individual leaders of the government system. So if you look at the division of labor in 1987, codified by the 13th Party Congress, you have five individuals occupying you know, more or less, right? So I, I, I want to emphasize that term, more or less um, equal uh, positions of power, right? Uh, General Secretary Zhao Ziyang, President of the country Li Xianmian, and Chairman of the Central Military Commission Deng Xiaoping, Premier Li Peng, uh, chairman of the Central Advisory Commission, Chen Yun. You know, people may argue, oh no, actually the real leader was Deng Xiaoping. That, that's true, right? Deng was definitely more powerful than the others, but it wasn't in a way that, uh, that, that Deng was a, was a absolute uh, straw man. He had to negotiate, he had to uh, compromise. And the simple fact is that this structure, sort of five uh, power structure, potentially gave these different individuals and the individuals who would occupy these positions later on some ability to check and balance each other. Right? So, so that, that's a, that is a very unique feature. I'm going to come back to, to this column uh, later on. Um, and then there were quite radical political reforms in the 1980s. You know, one little sort of uh, factoid that, that is not very well known is that uh, Zhong Nanhai was actually open to the public. Uh, you just buy a ticket, you, get, you, you go in and you look around, oh, this is where uh, Zhao Ziyang works, this is where Li Peng works. Right? Maybe not that close by, but at least you could sort of see them. Um, uh, there was separation of party and the management of the enterprises, of the SOEs. In 1988, uh, the Chinese state began to abolish CC, uh, CCP branches in some ministries. Right? Um, and this is interesting. So the economic reforms in the 1980s were much more bottom up rather than top down, which means that when the reforms happened, 
there was not yet a political decision to go with the reforms or not to go with the reforms. So People's Daily will publish two competing editorials side by side, debating with each other you know, whether or not they should do this and whether or not they shouldn't do it. Right? It's, just, it's just remarkable, right? Uh, and uh, People's Daily, I mean, think about today, right? So the People's Daily editorial would uh, communicate exactly the same message. Uh, intellectuals uh, criticized Deng Xiaoping by name and got away with it for many, many years. In the end, they didn't, but they got away as long as they did. Political campaigns, right? so there was like anti-spiritual campaign, there were other political campaigns. They were actually you know, remarkably short-lived, usually like three months, and that's it. Compared with today, anti-corruption campaign is 10 years uh, uh, on and, and still going very strong, right? Ministry of Agriculture declared in 1983 the anti-spiritual <coughs> campaign. Oh, that's not relevant to us. You know, agriculture is not really suitable for anti-spiritual campaign. We're not going to do it. And then once they said that, uh, by the way, Ministry of Agriculture was the most reform-oriented ministry in China. Once they said that, Another ministry will come out and say, yeah, come to think of it, it really has nothing to do with us, and we wouldn't do it, right? Each, many of these government agencies will come out and say, well, it's, it's really nothing to do with us. So it died within three months. I mean, just imagine doing that today. Um, in 1989, uh, under pressure, to be sure, Zhao Ziyang proposed asset disclosures on the part of the Politburo members. So we shouldn't forget that. I mean, it's really, it's really, uh, it's 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 really a very important uh, period in Chinese politics. Economic reforms, uh, as I said before, uh, came from bottom up, um, and township and village enterprises, very famous uh, phenomenon in rural China. In 1984, there were some 12 million of uh, TVEs. 10 million of them were purely private. It, it just, scholars got it totally wrong when they said TVEs were run by the local governments. They are confusing two things. One is the ownership, the other is the location. I checked the original definition published by the Chinese government of the TVEs. The Chinese definition of TVEs is that these are enterprises located in township and villages, not owned by townships and villages. Right? It's almost like saying Harvard is located in Cambridge, and then you draw from that observation and say, oh, actually, Harvard is owned by the Cambridge. Right? I mean, it's, just, it's just totally wrong. I mean, this Western scholars carried away with that wrong notion for all these years and without ever checking the details. Ten million of them were purely private, completely private. Um, rural financial reforms, again, Western scholars will tell you oh, China never undertook financial reform. Totally wrong. China in the 1980s undertook substantial rural financial reforms. Officially sanctioned, rather than kind of a spontaneous <coughs> informal finance, one very famous institution, Rural Credit Foundation, nationwide in operation, covering 40% of the townships and villages. Right? And initially, the PBOC, the Central Bank of China, didn't recognize the Rural Credit Foundation. Well, no problem. Ministry of Agriculture said, OK, we will recognize them. Right? Problem solved. Um, it, it, it just, you know, it's hard to recreate the energy level, the political energy level of the 1980s. My sort of dry telling of it doesn't do justice to just how incredible that era was. It was a golden era of uh, China's uh, economic development, rapid GDP growth, so we can take, 
take that for granted. Um, but most importantly, the personal income growth outpaced the GDP growth, right? So essentially the household income, rural household income, urban household income grew at lower rate as compared with rural household income, but combined the two, they grew faster than the GDP. That means that for each one percentage point of GDP growth, the Chinese people got a bigger share of the growth. The Gini coefficient actually declined. Uh, income uh, inequality initially actually declined. Growth was driven purely by the domestic demand, right? All the trade stuff was not there. FDI was not there. The personal consumption GDP ratio was 50% uh, the highest uh, ever in the uh, 40 years of Chinese reforms. Now it's about 40%. The lowest point was 2010, 34%, 34%. Tiananmen was the pivotal turning point. Um, after Tiananmen, it was conservative politics and biased economic reform. Ref economic reforms still continue, but in a very biased direction. Uh, I think the politics and the economics of the 1980s incubated the seeds for future extreme autocracy. There was crony capitalism of the 1980s that seeded corruption, right? And, and then the corruption was used as a uh, justification for power grab. Um, and there was recentralization of power Immediately after the Tiananmen, the elders got together and they decided to re-centralize the power because they wanted to support Jiang Zemin. Jiang Zemin came in all of a sudden and he was relatively weak. He didn't have political base in Beijing. So the elders decided and they needed to do that to uh, strengthen his power by giving a lot of decision-making uh, power to the general party secretary. Political developments in the 1990s uh, basically went from decentralization, from fragmentation to centralization. Five centers of power collapsed into two. Reverse explicitly all the political reforms of the 1980s. The party constitution was revised to put party back into the SOEs, to put party back into the government agencies. Junahai uh, was closed again, so yeah, okay. And very importantly, the Central Advisory Committee, which served as the fifth power center in the 1980s, that was abolished. Right. So we have the this structure now, right? So. It, this is 1980s divided by five individuals. In the 1990s, basically it was divided between two individuals. And the Central Advisory Commission was uh, abolished. I'm going to come back to that, uh, the abolition of the Central Advisory Commission. So this is something that um, I have created to measure political fragmentation over time. Essentially, this is the, the counts of the names of uh, party secretary, premier, and other members of the Polo Bureau Standing Committee in the People's Daily's editorials, right? So the assumption is that if the editorials mention many, many of these people, it's indication of more shared power, right? At least in terms of communication to the public, they felt it's necessary to talk about the party secretary, but also necessary to talk about the premier, also necessary to talk about other Politburo members. Uh, members. So let me just tell you what these numbers mean. This is the mentions of the party secretary in the 1980s. At this level, average level, about 15. It means that for each given year, uh, his name came up about 15 times. The uh, the solid line is the premier, 
right? The average uh, mentioning of the premier, and he got mentioned 22 times. This is the other uh, standing committee Politburo members' names. Okay, as you can see, the premier, uh, this is 1989 to 2002. This is during the Jiang Zemin period. The premier's name collapsed. And basically, it has sort of stayed at this low level. The party secretary's name shot up. Right? There was some increase of the, um, of the standing committee members, but not enough, right? So if you tally all these numbers together, not enough to make up for the both the rise of the uh, general secretary as well as the fall of the premier. Look at Hu Jintao period. Polo, uh, other uh, Polo, uh, Polo Bureau standing committee members, <coughs> it declined. And then the premier name only came up like 0.5 each year. And the, this is the general secretary, a little bit of the decline. This is Jiang Zemin. Jiang Zemin got more mentions. Uh, Hu Jintao got less. And look at Xi Jinping. Right. So this is his first term, 2013 to 2017. So this is 117 times uh, during this period. And these guys, these other guys, you may just very well don't know who they are uh, <laughs> if, you, if you just follow people's daily, right? So as you can see, this is a very distributed power um, distribution, right? So kind of a shared power got centralized here, got centralized here, and got extremely centralized uh, uh, under Xi Jinping. Right? So, but the true, but the point I'm, I want to make is the true turning point is here. Right? Because if you look at other indicators, they, both of them, uh, the centralization indicators uh, all picked up. What about corruption? Uh, this is in my Rise and Fall book. Tiananmen was also the turning point. So this is uh, 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 referring to the monetary value of average and median corruption cases reported in the Chinese media. Um, in the 1980s, the average value is about 120 RMB. Immediately after Tiananmen from 1990 to 2002, it shot up to almost 4 million. Right? So from 120, shot up to 4 million. And then there's another gigantic rise under uh, Hu Jintao. That's 30 million. Right? And if you sort of use other measures normalized by GDP using not average value but median value, you get exactly the same story. So, so essentially, the findings are robust to, uh, to the measures that you use. Uh, so let me uh, end my presentation. Well, not, not quite. Right? So let me, let me get to the Central Advisory Committee, the long-term impact of the abolition of Central Advisory Committee, abolished after Tiananmen. In an autocracy, the only meaningful constraint that they have is that the predecessors check and balance the incumbent. Right? That's the only, because media is not going to do that. Uh, universities are not going to do that. Jack Ma is not going to do that. So, so the only meaningful constraint comes from the predecessors on the current <coughs> incumbents. The Central Advisory Committee provided a formal institutionalized legitimate platform to exercise that constraint. Right? So for those of you who are not familiar with the Central Advisory Committee, uh, actually it should be commissioned, who, who are not familiar with it, it is an institution created by Deng Xiaoping in 1982 or maybe 83 to have the retired elders to retire into this institution, and then the institution gave them formal participation power 
not decision power, but participation power. They can sit at the Politburo meetings. They can voice their opinions, right? They can evaluate you know, the performance. Um, then we can come back to some of the details, and a lot of them did a lot of damage in the 1980s for sure. Uh, but I'm talking about an institution that, uh, that could have gone beyond the longevity of the specific members in that institution in the 1980s. Right? So it was, a, it was the only legitimate platform to exercise that constraint. I mean, it's quite similar to House of Lords in British politics in some ways. Um, so let me ask the counterfactual question, right? So which is, had the Central Advisory uh, Commission still existed as an institution, you know, would it have been as easy as it was in, in 2018 to abolish the constitutional term limit? I don't think we know the answer, right? I don't think we, we will never know because the, 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 the Central Advisory Commission was not there in 2018. But as social scientists, we always ask counterfactual questions. I personally don't believe that history somehow is determined by impersonal economic structural factors. I think history is really determined by these personalities, by institutional shocks and, and developments. So we know the history that happened, uh, but very often we don't know the history that didn't happen but could have happened. Right? So maybe if the Central Advisory Commission was still there, um, maybe he could have more company um, in 2020, uh, 2022. Right? So essentially what happened was that once you got rid of this institution, the predecessors could still check and balance the current serving politicians, but only in their individual capacity. Right. So that means that it is an issue of biology. <laughs> if you are very robust, uh, if you're in good health, you can exercise that power. But if you're not, then that power is weak. And once you get rid of that institutional base, the people who could have exercised that check and balance are by definition people at the very top, right? Like Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin. Whereas the Central Advisory Commission gave that power to the cohort or several cohorts of the former uh, former uh, leader. So it's, a total, it's going to work out totally differently. So let me uh, talk about, uh, move very fast to the current period, uh, the economics and politics of uh, the Xi era. And so here, I think many people know that uh, during the Xi Jinping era, uh, economic growth was um, viewed not as important as during the Deng era. So essentially, the GDP targeting um, was um, was was um, uh, was less in, was less actively pursued as it was before. So Deng Xiaoping famously formulated this idea, right? The CCP's first principle is development, right? Development is the hard truth. Uh, GDP targeting has its problems. I mean, my book before I criticized GDP targeting. But its biggest contribution is that it pivoted the CCP from its usual customary activities such as power struggles, ideological extremism, and paramount insecurity. Right? So the larger effect of the GDP, GD, so you criticize GD, GDP targeting because uh, it permitted pollution, uh, it um, uh, allowed the evictions of the rural uh, peasants, um, it encouraged corruption. I think all these are legitimate. But the larger benefit of the GDP targeting is that CCP was going to pursue GDP rather than doing these other things. <laughs> right? so, so essentially, that's kind of the trade-off you have to think about. Right? Um, and 
And also GDP targeting anchors the state actions on objective or quasi-objective facts and conditions, such as labor capital ratio, foreign trade relations, foreign direct investments. So these are the things that the government doesn't really have direct control over. You kind of have to observe these binding constraints. Uh, GDP targeting also encourages experimentation and pragmatism. Right? You know, I, I still feel legitimate to criticize GDP targeting within a narrow uh, framework, but if you have a broader framework, in terms of political and economic trade-off, then I think GDP targeting is actually a better uh, goal for the uh, Chinese government to pursue. So there was this pivot from economics to politics in recent years. Uh, economic growth was relegated to maybe a secondary or even tertiary principle. And by doing that, you lose the objective anchoring effect of economics. Right? basically making the Chinese state more discretionary and more arbitrary. So autocratic politics is highly subjective and discretionary, subject to large degree of variances and inconsistency. So at least GDP targeting gives you some consistency. The returns from politics are going to be high Right? So people are engaged in power struggles, ideological attacks, personality cult, personal fealty. Right? All these things have returned, right? as many of you know. Um, and the CCP is losing its systematic metric-based quality that was established during the Deng era. So let me end by talking about just what happened in the last two years, why this highly anticipated economic recovery after COVID didn't actually happen. Um, so I would say it's confidence, uh, stupid. Uh, let me elaborate on that. So Adam Posen of the Peterson Institute of International Economics proposed a very creative framing of what is happening to the Chinese economy, the long economic COVID. My own kind of framing is similar to that, but I will call it long political COVID. Um, and so just think about that. A economy, a society has three sectors, government, business, and household. Right? What has happened in the last 10 years is sequentially, each one of these three sectors, confidence has been undermined one by one first government, then business, and the COVID has done this massive undermining of the confidence in the household sector. Right? Um, so from 2013 to 2018, the anti-corruption uh, undermined the incentive and the confidence in the government sector. So some of you may have heard this term, lazy government, lan zheng, right? That was basically the official version and the early version of lying flat. So it first happened in the official sector. That began to happen around 2014, 2015. Right? It first happened in the official sector. And then it happened in the business sector right? because of the anti-corruption campaign, the regulatory crackdowns in 2020 and 2021 uh, on the business sector. Right, undermine the incentive and confidence of the business sector. Now you see declining investment and capital flight to save uh, havens. Now we are talking about the lockdowns. Right? So my framing of the long COVID is actually not because of the COVID itself. It's really about the effect of the measures to control COVID. A lot of the economic problems come from the measures to control COVID rather than from COVID as a disease. Right? Essentially, what the COVID lockdowns, it had, it had a signaling effect. It's basically saying economy doesn't matter. Right? Just think of it, right? So you put the entire country on lockdown. Firms were ordered to shut down. Stores were 
order to shut down. Is there a better way to communicate to the public <coughs> that you don't care about GDP? <laughs> right? I, don't, I can't think of anything, right? And so essentially that kind of GDP uh, is not that important. That began to register in the official sector in 2014, 2015, 2016. In the business sector around you know, 2019, 2020, 2021, now in the household sector in 2022. Right? So essentially this is how this effect has migrated from the official to the household sectors. Um, and the COVID lockdowns demolished the sense of security and economic confidence of the household sector. Right? Estimated, uh, uh, the estimation is some 400 million people were under some sort of lockdown uh, at one point in time. Right? In no other country would you do that. Right? In the United States, you know, Obviously, we didn't do it very well, right? So we probably relaxed too much. In India, there's that debate about economics and uh, public health. But when you put 400 million people under some sort of lockdown, you order every shop to be closed, you order every business to be closed, clearly there's not a discussion about the trade-off between public health and economic development. Unprecedented in human history. I can't think of anything that that's on that scale, right? The state power was completely unconstrained. Right? Basic security was shattered. You lost shelter. You lost access to basic necessities. Detention power was exercised at will, right? So if you think about this from a property rights perspective, this was a massive violation of every kind of right you can think of. Lying flat now was generalized to the entire society. If the household sector didn't get that message before 2022, they got it now. So zero, zero COVID, the way I put it, is zero COVID lockdowns are probably history's single biggest destructive act of economy, collective security, and a sense of confidence about the future. So thank you very much. I remember uh, when the 2008 book came out, uh, I was still a graduate student at the University of Michigan and uh, Yasheng came uh, to Michigan to give a talk. I was in the audience uh, and uh, just so humbling that today we can see it uh, shoulder to shoulder and just listen to your new book and all the insights. Um, you know, the problem is I'm much in agreement with Yasheng. So, um, uh, I, I totally agree that uh, you know, I was born in the 1980s, that's the glorious days, uh, and uh, we all miss the 1980s, and then things have uh, uh, made a really uh, bad turn since uh, 1989, and uh, uh, we all know that the last 10 years uh, are probably the, the worst years in my life, uh, probably. And, uh, but I do want to ask some questions. I know that the audience also has a lot of questions to ask Ya so I'll try to uh, be brief. Um, one, I guess one thought when one question, and uh, the thought is, um, you know, we all live in this era, right? So we, you know, I guess uh, from the youngest member in the audience to the oldest, uh, uh, the last 40 years occupy a, um, a good share of our life. And uh, so we all tend to think, you know, that's, that's the norm. And then, you know, 1980s, you know, even 1990s, uh, you know, there was some kind of leadership. Uh, and then we all think that, um, the last 10 years, right, is, is, is one exception. And this is not, this is not right. There's something is wrong, right? Something is wrong is about China. But then also thinking about Ya Sheng's uh, most recent book, you know, which goes back to 2000 years. And then uh, let, that really let me think, it's probably uh, the norm, you know, we are living in, you know, the last 10 years, it's probably going back to the norm uh, where China has been in the last 2000 years. We have a, you know, in the past is an emperor, now a president that uh, is not constrained by anything, right? Uh, there's no institutional constraints on the emperor's power in imperial China. Now there's no, uh, no institutional constraints on Xi Jinping's power. And then uh, politics has always uh, taken the dominance over the economy, right? The, the emperors didn't care about the economy. They always care about struggles, you know, it's about you know, getting rid of people that they don't like. And then now we are going back to that. So I think 
you know, my thought is, uh, you know, we are really uh, going back to the norm of Chinese politics that we have seen in the last 2,000 years. So maybe 1980s and even 1990s were just an exception. You know, we are extremely yeah. lucky. Right? We are extremely lucky to be able to live in, you know, to, to witness 1980s yeah. and then maybe some of 1990s. But, you know, we have to admit that's the exception yeah. of 2,000 years yeah. rule of in autocratic rule in China, right? And then so we, you know, which means um, uh, we should not get our hopes too high that uh, we can still go back to that 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 glorious uh, era of China. Uh, so that's just one thought. I have some questions, and then just uh, you know, you can choose to answer some of them. Maybe uh, one is um, I have a slightly different interpretation of the last forty years or fifty years of Chinese politics. I think. One thing that, um, so, so you mentioned 1989 as a turning point, but for me, I also think that uh, there's a, a very important a variable uh, uh, that is very, very important, and uh, which helps us understand you know, why we see that in the 1980s, we see 1990s, and we see Xi Jinping. That is the power of the founding families. Um, you know, and uh, this is true for every dynasty in China that, uh, um, because every dynasty in China was founded on some violent war, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Communist Party, you know, uh, took over China through a violent revolution, and then through any revolution, there has to be a coalition of elite members. They fought together, mm -hmm. and then when they fought together, you know, to win the revolution, uh, they have to make an agreement after they take the country, and then the agreement, you know, I don't know. I guess uh, in the 1940s, 1950s, is all the founding family, the Mao family, the Deng family, you know, and um, uh, they probably agree to something to share power, right? They agree that we, you know, uh, there, is, there should be some uh, arrangement, either institutional or informal, that each family will have a share in the pie. And then also they want to guarantee that their, their descendants, their children will also have a share of the pie, right? And then the Bo family, the Xi family, so on and so forth. And then we do see that, you know, we don't, there's some, um, some um, uh, violation of that agreement, I guess, during the Mao era. Mao did try to get rid of some of the families, but didn't, but not all of them, right? So he still keeps, you know, uh, Deng, for example, he didn't destroy Deng, right? Deng was still, um, uh, pretty much alive and then he was able to come back. We see really this arrangement during the early reform era in the 1980s that uh, we see the power sharing between the Deng family, you know, the, the, Chen, the Chen Yun family, Bo family, Xi family, so on and so forth. And then they have some arrangement and then they make sure that they each have a say, you know, the, the, the Central Advisory Commission is basically a, an institutional platform to make sure that each member of the family will have a say, right, have a voice. And then uh, the problem is those families don't last. This is the true uh, truth for every dynasty in the past as well, because those founding families, they will die out, right? And then usually after three generations, you know, the children, the grandchildren don't go into politics, then they go into art, fashion design, they don't, they don't care about politics. And, uh, and gradually, you know, in the 1990s, 2000, uh, those families just, you know, those, the younger members of the family just die out, or they, they stop entering politics. And then the only two, uh, who under politics were Xi and Bo, so and then so and uh, so, which means that um, the constraining power on any of the founding families is now weaker, right? You know, the uh, we we no longer have maybe five families. You talk about you know uh, in the 1980s there are five centers, and then those are all representatives of the founding families, and then but uh, in the 1990s, 2000, gradually we don't have that. Um, power coming from the, the red elders, the red families. And then that's, so that's my, uh, you know, that's another way of interpreting what happened in China in the last 40 or 50 years. It's, certainly the, the Tiananmen uh, is a turning point, I totally agree. But also we have this continuous decline of the power of the, uh, the red families, the, the, the founding families. So that's just my, uh, my overall thought. And um, um, one last question, I guess, just throw out there, and uh, you can uh, see whether you want to uh, engage, is uh, this recent uh, pivot away from GB, uh, G GDP, right? We, we know that you know, during COVID, uh, you know, Xi Jinping certainly signals to the audience, to the people that, you know, I don't care about GDP, I care about party building, I care about stability, I care about uh, anti-corruption. I wonder whether, you know, so uh, when you talk about it, it seems that it's a choice, right? So Xi Jinping chose to 
pivot away from GDP. But I wonder whether uh, it, it was a choice. I wonder whether he was forced to pivot away from GDP because we all know that economic growth has marginal, decreasing marginal returns. That in after 40 years of rapid growth, it's impossible to grow at 10% anymore. You know, uh, in the uh, uh, 2010 in 2020s, and then so um, uh, what if right? He was very smart. Actually, he was you know he knew that he knew that he cannot uh, have high growth anymore, and then he knows that the legitimacy of the party really comes from something. He has to do something else when GDP stopped growing, and then he's, he he you know he he was forced to pivot away, uh, pivot away from GDP growth to focus on those other things. Uh, you know. Anti-poverty, for example, there's an anti-poverty cam uh, campaign, anti-corruption campaign. Although it's very destructive to the bureaucracy, but people like it. You know, in the first several years of the campaigns, you know, people really welcome the anti-corruption campaign. So I think, you know, is it possible that uh, you know he was actually very rational? He was very smart, and then he 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 knew that GDP is no longer reliable. Mm -hmm. He has to choose something else okay. to rely on. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you, Yuha. Those are excellent uh, comments. Let me sort of talk about the, um, the founding family idea and then the GDP idea. I think the fund, so I agree with you, there's this founding family power sharing. To some extent, I don't quite, um, for me, what I pay attention to is not so much why you have this arrangement as opposed to the effect of it, right? So the effect of it is whether it's family power or something else, you have some diffusion of power, right? Um, and more distributed uh, uh, power uh, as opposed to a highly concentrated power. So what I care about is really that effect. The formation of it could be family, could be, could be those things. But I do want to cripple the formation part of your observation. If you see the founding family as the reason driving the power distribution, then it should be a gradual process, right? Uh, because it's a function of biology, human biology. What we see in the data is actually a very discrete, disruptive uh, shock, 1989. Mm. And so just essentially before 1989 and after 1989, you see a big change in the configuration of the power. And the uh, biology would actually predict persistence of these arrangements far longer than 89, right? Uh, Chen Yun died in 1995, uh, Deng Xiaoping died in 1997, um, and Wan Li and people like that, they died in, in 2002, 2003. Song Ping is still alive. Mm. I mean, he attended, yeah, right. <laughs> the, 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 he's 100 years old, or 100, maybe more than 100 years old. And, and also, so, so this is, you know, I, I think you, are, you probably will not disagree with me because both of us are in, interested in institutions, right? So, the whole idea of an institution is that it is going to, um, first it's going to evolve, right? So at the beginning you could have the family power, mm -hmm. but beyond that you could also absorb new forces. And the other is that the institution is by definition impersonal, right? So that maybe Li Keqiang could have become part of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, Maybe he wouldn't die. Right? So who knows, right? So and and um, and, and you know Hu, uh, Hu Jintao and um, uh, you know Li Zhanshu and all all these people, right? So they could be absorbed by this uh, institution. And Bo Xilai, you made a point about Bo Xilai. I I agree. I actually think that Chinese politics today would be very very different if Bo Xilai was not toppled, because um, Bo Xilai. But that's more of a personal hmm. intervention rather than institutional, right. because Bo Xilai had the confidence and had the security, you know, red family, all of that, to sort of speak his mind. And uh, so they could be, I think the Chinese politics today would be more uh, moderate hmm. if, hmm. if uh, 
uh, Bo Xilai was there, and then there could be some sort of this personal check and, check and balance. In terms of your, um, your point about GDP, I, I think I, I don't really know what his motivation was. Nobody knows, mm. right? So we all have to hypothesize. But I think there's a difference between sort of accepting that you cannot grow GDP. There's a difference between that and, and then you actively doing things mm. to reduce GDP growth, right? So you mm. crack down on the private sector, you, you, you sort of, um, you know, you investigate foreign firms to make sure that FDI is not going to come in, right? So, the, so, so your uh, theory applies more to accepting lower GDP growth as a fact, right? Because there are uh, reduced marginal returns from GDP growth. That, I totally agree. You know, if, if, if you and I were in his position, mm. Precisely because we cannot take it for granted that GDP growth is going to be 8%, 9% every year, we have to do really other <laughs> things to make sure it is not going to be 0%, right? So, so that will predict more active efforts to buttress GDP growth rather than to suppress GDP growth, right? So anyway, yeah. yeah. Great. I, by the way, I totally agree with your first observation, you know, which is we are going back to yeah. norm. The only exception I will take is that that's true, but Chinese today, uh, China today is not Chinese history, right? Mm. Globalization, mm. private sector development, technology, uh, foreign education, you know, you can think about yeah. all these other things, and even those things didn't stop going back to right. the, right. yeah. Right. Great, yeah. So I guess now we will um, want to listen to, to you guys and uh, please raise your hand and uh, I think the, uh, they also need to identify themselves, right? Okay, yeah, please identify yourself if you want to ask a question to Professor Huang. My name is Dio Xiao. I'm a retired professor of economics. Uh, I have uh, that wonderful talk. Thank you. <coughs> I have a uh, question. Uh, you're talking about elite politics yeah. and also the recent history. That's very rich and meaningful. However, if I apply Marx's law theory of human needs, Chinese people, when they're hungry and they don't have shelter, the common people don't care about autocratic rule or democracy. They want to be fed and clothed and housed. And the second level of Maslow theory is people want security. Now once you have that, then people want individual respect and some dignity. Both of you talk about Chinese caste empire. But Chinese people have changed. Now, pe Chinese people have said, have enough to eat. Most Chinese have security. Could the autocrat still hold on to power? In light of the grassroots has changed, according to Maslow's theory. Yeah. Yeah. So the Maslow preference ordering is exactly the way that you laid out. Um, but that's a more kind of a normative rather than empirical um, statement. And if, if you use the Maslow theory to explain China, it's actually, it fits with data very poorly, right? Because in the 1980s, China was much more poorer than China today. And yet, according to my measure, China was most democratic uh, and most open. So at the time when China was actually quite poor. So I emphasize elite politics because, because I, I, the reason why I don't buy the kind of modernization theory or mass love theory is because in autocracy, I mean, let's just be realistic. Uh, it is the elites who decide on, on politics, <laughs> on the nature of the political system, on economic policy. It is not the masses, and 
uh, uh, Yuhua also knows this data very well. Uh, uh, according to um, uh, empirical research on 20th century, 75% of the collapse of uh, collapses of the autocracies are caused by elite uh, uh, rebellions, not by the not by the masses. Historically speaking, um, same thing. It's, it's really the the, very, the the reason why the imperial system was so stable was because they were able to achieve elite peace and stability. If you look at the masses, they rebel all the time and all of that, but that was not enough to change the imperial uh, stability. But looking forward, right, so Bill, I think your question has the flavor of looking forward, whether or not given the living standards of the Chinese people today, given the global connections and modern values, whether or not the kind of system that has been in place in the last 10 years and increasingly in the last five years, can that be stable? I, I, I think that's a very legitimate question. And, 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 but I would put it slightly differently. I would put it this way. The, uh, the instability, I think, will come from a mismatch. The mismatch is that there are basically two equilibria. One is that if you don't make money, if you don't spend money, you're okay. You can be stable, right? No income, no expenditure. Sort of like me now on sabbatical. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, or you spend a lot of money, but you make a lot of money. So both are happy equilibria. The situation that is not stable is in between. You spend a lot of money, you don't make any money. China today is in that situation. You spend money on Belt and Road, you spend money on semiconductors, you spend money on urbanization, you spend money on common, pro common prosperity, but you also crack down on the growth engine of the Chinese economy. Essentially, you have a mismatch between income side and the expenditure side. I just don't think that can be stable. And I do interpret the recent effort to repair the relationship with the United States as a preliminary step to address that imbalance, right? So my own prediction, it can be very naive, can be very optimistic a prediction. My own prediction is that there will be some domestic relaxation of economic and maybe even social controls, uh, followed by repairing the relationship between US and, and, and China. If China is successful in going back to that, say to the Hu Jintao era, not all the way to uh, Deng Xiaoping era, you know, I, I think, you know, the, so this is going back to the, the long-term tendency of China towards stability. I think China can manage, right? So you can go back, you get decent growth once again, you could have some intellectual space, you know, I can, they, can, they, can, they can manage. But if they persist, then this imbalance is going to, is going to grow. And that's very, very problematic. Um, over there, that gentleman over there. So I have a question about the uh, importance of the central advisory committee by the yeah. of importance as a strategic advisor and so influence. But to me, my first point I want to make is that if you look in the history in the 1980s, the, the real practice of the Bongo is never, never like institutional way. And it was quite based on like personal will. Yeah, agents. sure. Yeah. Extremely check and balance yeah. from the Fed side. Yeah, sure. So how to explain yeah. them, why we see that uh, she's error the total change so it's it's yeah. so it's something else besides the importance sure. of the central Yeah, so so the, uh, there's no contradiction between those uh, observations. Um, you know, I'm a 
institutional scholars who emphasize the importance of institutions. In the 1980s, the Central Advisory Commission was extremely dysfunctional. Extremely. They overstepped their power. They sacked Hu Yaobang. They basically sacked Zhao Ziyang as well. So th that's why many Chinese liberals criticized uh, uh, the Central Advisory uh, Commission. But th we have to think about these things in evolutionary terms, in dynamic terms, right? So, um, you know, pe people die, right? So, so the, the, those personalities would exit from history. You can have new members, right? Younger and new members, their behavior could be different. And also remember in the 1980s, that was the founding of the institution. When you are a founding member, you always feel that you are entitled to do more than you are sort of implicitly allowed, right? So I, I'm not surprised by that at all. But the thing is, 30 years out, right? If essentially you have a situation where the politics is more contentious, it could be personal interventions, it could be you know personalities and things like that. But, but the thing is, we have to look at institutional evolution. You always started with personal antagonism, personal negotiation. As long as the institution is there, you have an incentive to write rules of the game, to write the, uh, the rules into the uh, uh, established norms. Maybe in the future they will say, OK, on these things we intervene, on other things we don't intervene. Right? So again, this is a counterfactual, right? Whether or not it's going to get there, I have no idea. But I am reasonably optimistic as an institutionalist to believe that institutions work out their problems. People work out their problems. When in the 1980s, the reason why the institution was so powerful was because they were founding members of the PRC. 30 years out, they were not. They are not going to Li Keqiang. You know, so it's going to be very, very different, right? So uh, less confident and more technocratic. Wang Yang, think about Wang Yang, right? Hu Chunhua, people like that, right? So those people' behavior will be very, very different. In terms of your Hu Jintao era, you're absolutely right. But that's kind of the point I'm making, right? That was because of the personal intervention of Jiang Zemin. It is dependent on his health, on his longevity, right? And on his personal willingness to intervene. Hu Jintao, for whatever reasons, decided not to do that. Maybe the health was an issue or whatever. I, I, I really don't know. He decided not to do that. But that's precisely my point. If you have an institution there, then the institutional intervention is not going to be dependent on the personal situations of one leader or two leaders, right? It's going to be more of an institutional uh, intervention. This, if you look at the evolution of democracy in the West, that's exactly how it happened. If you look at the evolution of democracy on Taiwan, Sort of like that, first within the party, you know, they didn't get along, they hated each other. But over time, they negotiated rules of the game and, um, and scope of their uh, interventions and interactions, right? So, you know, maybe that will never happen, but at least there's an opportunity for that to happen when you still have that institution. Thank you, Yasheng. Okay, thank Great you. Great talk, yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you.